Father, I want to thank you again for this evening, for the opportunity that we have to be together for fellowship and for study of your word. I thank you for every person who is on campus tonight, for those who are working with our preschoolers, for those who are serving with our children, those who are doing an adult or youth fusion class, every teacher, every facilitator, every person who's serving our security folks, all folks that help us with tech equipment, just everything and everybody that's here tonight, I just uh, thank you for our time. I thank you for folks right here in this room as we are desiring to know truth and to apply truth in our lives and cause truth to affect us deeply and spiritually. So I pray, Father, you bless and lead our time together this evening, for it is in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now tonight, as we look at how to receive truth, part two, the theme that I want you to do is I want to lodge in your memory right now that we're going to be carrying throughout the evening tonight is the very first thing on your study guide, and that is the value of truth. The value of truth. I'm going to be sharing that in a couple of times tonight, and I want to tell you all through our evening tonight, as I mention the word truth, we're talking about valuing truth. Now, that might, be, uh, might sound like I'm overstating the case here. Surely a group that would come together on a Sunday night and study in a discipleship setting believes that the Bible is true, that it is the truth of the Word of God. And so uh, it might seem a little bit uh, saying too much to, to cause you to focus on truth. But some of the things that we're talking about tonight you will have heard before, or we will look at some scriptures, and I'm going to hopefully lead you to some scriptures, and because of the, the framework and the groundwork that we're laying, you're going to read some passages of scripture tonight, maybe from a different context than you've ever read them before. I'm not saying I'm sharing with you new truth. It might be new to you, but it's certainly not new to God. It's not new to the Word of God. But because sometimes the way we come to a passage of scripture or because of where we're just kind of reading along and really not picking up the flow of the context we might miss on what the writer is saying and so we want to value truth this evening. Now the last time we were together I shared with you that there are two things that we're looking at in these first couple of sessions and that is who you are and who you were. Who you are as a disciple of Jesus Christ, as a believer in Jesus Christ, and who you were before you gave your life to Christ. Now before we move on to our second part tonight, you're going to say, he said, he said that enough. I'm going to sound like a one-note Johnny. Now, If you don't know what no, one-note Johnny is, one-note Johnny is a guy who played the tuba in the school band, but he only could play one note. Now, he played that note very well. But the only time he ever got the, a chance to blow his horn was when that note came up in the scale. And so, if I sound like one note Johnny tonight, please listen. Because this whole area of understanding who you are currently as a believer in Christ, and I'm not assuming that everybody in the room tonight is a believer. I'm hoping everybody is, but I'm not assuming everybody is. But I am going to be speaking from the context of the believer. And those of you who are in Christ, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about who you are. And then who you were refers to who you were before you came to Christ, before you entered into a relationship with Christ. Now, if you don't know who you are in Jesus Christ, it will affect your prayer life. It will affect your confidence. And you will feel defeated and you will walk around defeated because you're not reckoning on who you are in Jesus Christ. But as we'll see tonight, it's also important that we understand who we were before we gave our lives to Christ, because who we were, that we all come from different cultures, in different environments. Some of you were raised in Christian homes. It was solid. It was biblical. You, you, your parents loved God and and, and they walked with God and they prayed at mealtimes and maybe even had family devotions at night before you went to bed. And for a lot of us, our home environment wasn't anything like that. We never saw mom and dad together. They never prayed. We never ate a meal together. 
Uh, the home environment was very caustic and very volatile. Some of you have actually seen your dad hit your mom. Uh, you, you've, you've seen a lot of different things, and because of who you were, coming up in that culture and in that environment has affected you. And it will affect you until you understand who you are in Jesus Christ. Now, the reason why we talk about these things, and it's the reason why it's important, is because of something else we said last week, is because we will act like who we think we are. Now, that's not in your notes, but hopefully it's going to be getting into your memory. We will act like who we think we are. In other words, if you think that you are junk, if you think that you're not valuable to God, He doesn't love you, He doesn't care for you, then you're going to act like that. But if you come to the place of understanding how He looks at you, that He does love you with an everlasting love, he does love you so much that He sent His own Son to die for you that you might have an everlasting life, an eternal life in Jesus Christ. And so it's so important that we understand who we are because we're going to act like who we think we are. Now I'm not suggesting that every morning when you go in the bathroom you need to look in the mirror and say, I am the greatest. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that. You might do that for a little while. You certainly, any kind of positive self-talk is better than negative self-talk. Uh, I'm reminded of a friend of mine who's now retired in the ministry and where he was pastoring at this particular church, he would leave his study and go to the worship center and as he passed from his study to the worship center, there was a little hallway that he went, to, went through and, and just before he went into the worship center, the door he would enter into, there was a mirror on the back of that door. Now what he would do, he would certainly look at that mirror and make sure his hair was okay, that his, his coat was okay and tight, you know, the, the, the knot on the tie was okay and everything. Well, on this one particular morning, as it was his custom, he had his lapel microphone on, but on this morning he had it turned on. And he's standing there looking at himself in the mirror, and right before he goes into the worship center, he says, go get him, tiger. Well, the people walked in, I mean, he walked in, and everybody was looking at him, and they were laughing. That, that's not a good way to begin a morning. So however it helps you to understand who you are in Christ, I mentioned last time about these uh, professions or these confessions of the possessions of a saint, and we have some of those sheets if you didn't get one last week. But it is helpful for you to understand who you are in Christ and to relish in that, not to the point of pride, not to the point of egotism, but to the point of self-confidence and Christ-centered confidence as who you are in Christ. We also talked last time about three levels of communication. We talked about information, inspiration, and illumination. And we found out last time and were reminded of the fact that information in and of itself will not set us free. Because in many cases, the information was not correct. It's not accurate. But Jesus said in John 8, 31 and 32, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the, what? The truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, later on, just a few verses later, Jesus shared a companion truth in verse 36, where he said, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Now, what we're talking about in these studies is valuing truth to the point that you become free to be the person that you are in Jesus Christ. And that's the track that we're taking tonight. We looked at Ephesians 4 and talked about some things there. And in that context, I shared a statement that's probably not too pleasing to the ear. But it's a statement that a guy, a dad might say to his son, because maybe his son's being rebellious, maybe he's being a whiny baby or whatever. And the dad would say, son, quit acting like a baby and start acting like a man. Now, the reason why we said that is what Paul is getting us to understand in Ephesians 4 and in other passages He's encouraging us to quit acting like who we used to be and start acting like and living out the life that we are. Four things, and I believe these are in your notes here. 
that are comparable to that little phrase and that are drawn right out of the Ephesian four passages, you were natural. When you were born, you were natural. You were born natural. You were born in trespasses and sin, Ephesians 2 says. All of us came into this life natural as people who do not possess a divine nature, do not have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Even little babies that are over there in the preschool area being cared for by our precious preschool workers preschool workers, those little babies are natural. They weren't born innocent. Now, they look like it the first few minutes of their life. <laughs> and then the reality sets in. We all came into this life natural. Secondly, you are a new person in Christ. You are new in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man be in Christ or any person be in Christ, he's a new creation. And so we are made new in Christ. Now the reality is we can act natural. Any of us and all of us, probably I'm guessing all of us without a doubt, knows what it, li knows what it is like to be a believer yet act like an unbeliever. We do things that unbelievers do. We, don't, we shouldn't, but we do. And so it's possible, not good, but it's possible as a believer to act natural. But fourth, you can also be and live out who you really are, this new person in Christ. And so that is in keeping with those. Now, the third and the fourth point is what we're really going to be zoning in on tonight and zooming in on. You can act natural, but you also can be the person that Christ made you to be. One of our goals tonight, at least in our first section, is to help us see one of the reasons why we still struggle with things. It's not because of who we are, it's because of who we were. And sometimes you're wondering, why is it that I'm still wrestling with some of this stuff? It's because of who you were. It's because of the environment you were brought up in. And so it's important that we know that. It's also true, and it may sound like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth, but both these statements are true. It is also true that we struggle with things because of who we are now. Jesus said, those who live godly will suffer, what? Persecution. And so... Even though you're living a Christian life today, some of the things you wrestle with because of who you are as a believer. And now you have a new sensitivity to sin. You have a new sensitivity to the ways of the world, and that, again, can cause you difficulties. Well, what we also found in that information, inspiration, and illumination thing is as we have better information, and as we get that information from the inspired Word of God, then our hearts can be illumined with truth and we can live in the reality of that truth. But to get there, truth or truths have to be taught. They must be taught. We don't get these by osmosis. We don't get these accidentally. We can get them in Sunday morning church and Sunday night fusion classes and Wednesday night Bible studies and, and women's Bible studies and men's Bible studies and and different Bible studies that you're part of. You can get them in, on your own personal Bible study at home. But truths have to be taught. But secondly, truth must be accepted. Truth must be accepted. These are not things that you do as we think of doing something. But they are accepted and they are applied and they are reckoned on as truth. And even in times where we haven't, where our experience hasn't quite caught up to uh, our faith. We, we have to faith those things. We have to believe those things by faith because they're in the Word of God. Truths must be accepted. Go with me once again to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 17. I want us to get these words in our minds one more time. Ephesians 4 and verse 17. Now notice as we read this, 
what Paul is talking about, comparing some folks who uh, were still lost, and now he's writing, of course, to these Ephesian believers. Ephesians 4, 17 says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. They were ignorant of the truths of God because, of course, they were lost. Because of the blindness of their heart, they couldn't see. They couldn't see spiritually. Who, these lost people, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness. We're going to come back to that word. To work all uncleanness with greediness, but you have not so learned Christ. You, Christians, you believers in, Ephesians, in Ephesus, you've not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, Paul then said in Ephesians 4.23 there, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. He also said, we're coming back to the Ephesians text here in just a moment, so just stay right there. He also said in Romans 12 that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And so the call there is to be renewed. Three phases or three phrases here that are on your, uh, in your study guide and probably be popping up one by one there. The first phrase here is to put off. Look at verse 22, Ephesians 4, 22, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. What Paul is saying here is, he's telling us now as Christians, quit living like we used to live. Put off those old ways. It's kind of like what Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians 13 where he says, when I was a child, I did childish things, but now I'm a man. I've put away those childish things. Well, what we say here as now that we're Christians, let's put away those old things and let's start living the Christian life. The second phrase here is to be renewed. It's there on the screen. Be renewed. And also is put on in verses 23 and 24. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man. Now what Paul is telling us here then is quit acting like who you used to be and start living who you are in Christ. Let me give you another way to read that passage. It's not in your notes, but just listen. Here's what Paul would say kind of in an amplified version. That you, Christians having already through salvation once and for all put off the old manner of life, that is, the old man with all its deceitful lusts, you who know Jesus Christ now be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man, put on Jesus Christ, be who you really are. Paul is making a very clear and emphatic plea and command. Quit acting like who you used to be. Start living who you are in Christ. The reason why Paul said what he said here is these truths have to be taught. They have to be heard and they have to be learned. The valuing of truth is very important. It's important for us to value truth and to live in the reality of truth. Now, to move away from that phrase, quit acting like a baby, start acting like a man, let's, let's move it to a marriage context. When somebody is married, and many of you are, what do married people do? You could just kind of be quiet right now, but <laughs> you act married. You do married stuff. You commit your life to each other. You care for each other. You live together. And you carry out the will of God in marriage. Now, is it true that all of those things can be done, 
by people who are not married except for the last item. People that are not married can act married. They can do what married people do. They can somewhat commit their lives to each other. I'll be back this evening. I mean, that's about as far maybe as the commitment goes. You might care for each other, and you certainly can live together. But as unmarried people, you can't fulfill the will of God for marriage. Now, the sign and the symbol of marriage is the wedding ring. That's an indication to everybody around that you're married. Now, if you take the wedding ring off, are you still married? Sure. Your wife will remind you of that, guys. <laughs> Some people will actually do that. They'll actually take off that wedding ring and they'll go out bar hopping or whatever, trying to pick up ladies and try to act married with that woman. Is that the will of God? No. The sign and the symbol of marriage is this wedding ring, but it's based upon a, com a covenant of commitment. And so now that you're married, now you, you quit acting like you used to be, and you start acting like and start living out who you're supposed to be as a believer in Jesus Christ. The idea here is putting on truth and living in the reality of that truth. Now, there are many images in the Bible that depict, word pictures that depict us as individuals. There is the family, a family of God. Uh, there's the building as a word picture. There's the cultivated field. And there is uh, there sheep. Sheep are often used. We're, you know, we're referred to often as sheep. And so we want to talk here about another image, and that is the image of the tree. Now, notice there in your outline, you have a, some white space there. And we're going to talk about, you're going to get to practice your artistic skills here in the next few minutes. Now, if you're just a stick person drawing, like me, you just I mean, all of us can kind of draw some kind of a tree. So right there where you are on that piece of paper, if you would just kind of draw a trunk of a tree, and then just draw some, like the foliage of a tree, and you might just kind of draw a line there. Uh, for where the ground would be and just kind of kind of draw you up a little tree there I, I think we, we're gonna have one up here in just a minute, but it doesn't need to be up there yet guys Just just hang with me. We'll, we'll come to that image. That's on the on the screen Now as you think about that tree and That tree represents you who you were before you gave your life to Christ there, was, uh, th there are things that happened to you that fed you, that became a part of you, that produced the foliage of your lost life. Different things happened to you that affected you. A tree, as we all know, bears fruit. Now, some trees bear fruit that we can eat. The apple, the orange, we could just go on and on. I have an ornamental fruit tree in my front yard, as yet it's to bear any fruit. It's not supposed to. It's ornamental. But it still bears fruit in foliage. It, in fact, I was trimming the fire of that thing yesterday. Uh, yesterday afternoon, it was, it's just kind of uh, growing out uh, beyond where it should be, and so we're cutting it back. And, and so I was trimming it, pruning it, so it can uh, look even nicer this year. But even a tree that doesn't produce food that you can eat still produces some kind of fruit. There's foliage that comes with it. Now let's think about that tree representing a person before he or she gives their life to Christ. Think about the kind of foliage that is produced from a life that is lost. Now, for the next few minutes, we're going to enact the reverse Miranda decision, which says, nothing you say can be held against you in a court of law. And so if I ask you, I'm going to ask you, what are some of the things that lost people struggle with? And you give me an answer. Nobody is going to believe that you had a problem with that. You're just a, you're just a well-informed person. And you know that other people have trouble with that, but you would never have a problem with that. And so we just want to get some things out on the table here, nothing necessary to write down, just to think about 
Some of the things that people struggle with. Give me something that lost people struggle with. Some kind of sin that people struggle with. Deceit. Okay, they deceive people. Greed. Okay. Self-control. Self Lying. Anger. Bitterness. That's right. Selfishness. I'm sorry? Immorality. Lust. Okay? We could just go on and on, could we? Thought life. A lot of us, if we could just get our thought life under control, we would feel like we had died and gone to heaven. A lot of things that people deal with. Now, of those things, and I'm not asking for an audible answer. This is an internal, personal answer. What's the biggie for you? What's the thing that you still wrestle with today? Now, the, the hurtful reality of that is, you're saying you're a believer, yet you're admitting you have a, an inner struggle. And that's, that's what we're coming to. I'm glad you're willing at least to be honest with yourself that you're still wrestling with that area. Turn with me now to 1 John 2, and we're going to find out what is it that feeds a tree that makes it what it is. 1 John 2 and verse 15. Now let's, uh, guys, let's go ahead and put this tree up on the screen here. You saw this tree last. I know your tree doesn't look anything like this one. Uh, Ray's looks exactly like that one. Uh, but this, you saw this tree at the end of our study last Sunday night. This is just kind of a little sample here of, of, a, of an idea of a tree. If I had a big chalkboard, I, I would have drawn one out for you, but we didn't, we didn't do that. Now many years ago, in fact, long before I knew what a tree was, my dad planted a tree in our backyard. And he nurtured for that, uh, that tree and he cared for that tree. Another thing he did when, when he planted that tree when it was young, and I noticed this as a young guy as I was cutting the grass uh, one day. One thing he also did was about three, three and a half feet away from the base of that tree, he buried a pipe in the ground on an angle down, and of course I could see the angle of it from looking at it, down toward the center and tap root, you might say, of that tree. Why did he do that? Sure, so he could feed that tree. So he get some water down into the root system of that tree. Now, there's two major factors that affect the health and life of a tree. First of all, there's that which comes to it from the outside. The rain, the wind, pests, the sun, all these things affect a tree positively and sometimes negatively. But there's also that which comes up from the root system and through the root system into that tree. Now, if my dad would have fed that tree gasoline, what would have happened? It would have killed it. If he had fed it some kind of food that it wasn't, you know, mashed potatoes and gravy, wouldn't have really helped that tree too much. It needed water. It needed, it needed some, some, maybe some food that, that, that a tree can absorb into its, into its system. So that's the focus we want to talk about now. That, that, that feeds a tree that information that fed your life that caused you to turn out to be the person that you used to be. Look what Paul, or excuse me, look what John says here in 1 John 2, beginning at verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Now there are three root systems that feed the tree of an individual life. And they're listed right here. 
The first one is the lust of the flesh. And for our time together, we're going to understand the lust of the flesh that it manifests itself in moral impurity. The lust of the flesh manifests itself in moral impurity. The second root system that feeds that tree, in fact, in your tree, uh, if you want to draw three kind of root systems just to kind of help you remember and tie all this together, just kind of three lines to kind of represent the roots of your tree. The second one is the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes manifests itself in materialism. Now these two are often confused and interchanged. Many people talk about the lust of the eyes as though it was moral impurity because you think of so much lust coming through the eyes. But the way in which we're talking about it, you see here. And the third one is the pride of life, which manifests itself in bitterness, anger, bitterness. Now, it's my belief and my conviction born out of studies that have been done by other people wiser than me, and yet I've seen it born out in, in the counseling room, and I don't talk about counseling appointments, just, just generally speaking, 70% of men have a problem with the lust of the flesh. That does not mean that 70% of men are running around their wives. That's not what that means. What, what I'm saying is 70% of men have a, a struggle in this area. And when they're walking in the flesh, not living as they are as Christians, but how they were, it manifests itself in moral impurity. 70% of women have a struggle in the area with the pride of life, which manifests itself in bitterness. We'll talk about that next week. And lust of the eyes manifesting itself in materialism, we'll also talk about next week, is kind of an equal opportunity employer. It's uh, both, both scale there. Now these root systems fed the tree, the real you, before you came to Christ. And what fed your tree produced the foliage of your fallen life and made you who you used to be. Let me say that again. These root systems fed the tree the real you before you came to Christ. And that produced the foliage, the fruit of your fallen life, a life without Christ. Now it's my belief, it's my conviction, that all of us have a struggle in one of these three areas. Tonight and next Sunday night as we talk about the other two root systems, you're going to be able to detect who you are. In fact, most of you probably already know who you are, or at least who you were. But I'm going to share with you some of the manifestations of the root system that fed your life, that produced who you used to be. And who you used to be is in many ways still affecting you especially when you're not walking in the Spirit. And I won't have to tell you, we won't have to have an appointment, I won't have to help you walk through these, you'll be able to pick this out yourself. What caused you to be the person that you used to be, even though you're still struggling in some of these areas? Now you might be asking, how is it that this happened? Was this predetermined by God? that I have this particular flesh pattern. That's, that's how we're going to refer to that as a flesh pattern. No, I believe it happened as a result of the experiences in your life. The environment that you grew up in. The kids that you ran around with. The things you did when mom and dad were not looking. The things you experimented with. 
the things you played around with, things you exposed yourself to. And all these experiences and all these things, many times you didn't invite them. I'm not saying that you, you were guilty. Some, some of you became the person that you are through no personal work or desire of your own. They happened to you because of the environment that you grew up in. But it is also true that a lot of times we open ourselves up to areas. We investigate. We curiously investigate areas of life. And before you know it, we're in a deep mess. And that, that fed us, that information that came into us, fed our tree, produced the foliage of who you used to be in Christ. And when those things continue year after year, decade after decade, they become etched into who you used to be, producing the tree that has your name on it. Now what I just shared with you for some of you, was very painful. Because things happened to you that you wish would have never happened to you. I can't tell you the number of times I wish God would somehow have given us the chemical ability to be able to proxide our minds. To unzip our head and just be cleansed of all that junk that we experience as kids, as teenagers, even as young adults. But for some reason, He hasn't given us that ability. He has given us, though, the tool to be able to clean our minds. And it's what? It's truth. Paul said, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Go with me to uh, Galatians chapter 5. Now Paul shares with us here who we were and who we are. Galatians 5 and beginning at verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and and by the way, the word lust here means to be at war against. So the flesh is at war against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now notice verse 19. Now the works of the flesh, these flesh patterns, the tree, it has your name on it. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, that's who some of us, I'm not saying any of us were all these things. But probably each of us have probably picked something out. Ooh, yeah, ooh, that's me right there. 
Okay, that's who you used to be. But, now you get saved. And a transition happens. So verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Now what we want to see here is who we used to be is born out in, in those first few verses. But now the potential of who we are now in Christ is the fruit of the Spirit. As we, as we bear fruit, as we walk in Christ, as we walk filled with the Spirit, the tree now that has your new name on it can produce a whole different kind of foliage. That's called the fruit of the Spirit. Are we together on that? What Paul's wanting us to see is who we used to be and now who we are. Uh, flip back a couple of pages to Galatians 2.20. Paul made this faithful, truthful declaration. And you need to make it as a faithful, truthful declaration for yourself, even if you don't feel it. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. That tree that you used to be is only a figment of your imagination. You can remember it because we don't have a spiritual peroxide. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, in this fleshly body, in this physical body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And there is the tension where we live today. We still have these bodies, and many times we still think about ourselves as who we used to be, as who we are. But who you used to be has been crucified, and who you are now is a believer in Christ, and we're going to talk about why things are still a struggle point for you. The Bible tells us that we need to learn and know who we are, that we know what is true and reckon on that truth. But here's the real struggle. Here's the reason why it's a struggle for us. As I mentioned earlier, years and years and years of bad stuff coming up into your tree through its root system that you didn't invite and maybe in some cases you did invite, has caused some etching in your mind and etching in your brain. And that's why you can still think about those things and still remember those things that happened to you. You can't remember the memory verse you were supposed to memorize last Sunday, but you can still remember what happened to you 20, 30, 40, 60 years ago for some of you because they're etched in you. Now, let's look at another graphic here on the bottom of your page there. I'm going to let you draw again. It's the graphic of a person. I'm going to ask you to, to kind of walk with me through this. And, fellas, if you go ahead and put that on there, this is you. If you would walk yourself uh, around, walk with me through this, just draw your circle, go ahead and put the Y there, and this is, this is you. Now also, when you add to those three quadrants, and notice this is you being divided up into three sections. You're a, you're, biblically speaking, you're a trichotomous being. You're a three-part being. And the three parts are body, soul, and spirit. So put those in your, in your graphic. Now as we think about body, soul, and spirit, your soul is further divided up into three components. Your mind, your will, and your emotions. Now with your mind, that is your thinker. Your will is your chooser. 
and your emotion, they, they are your feeler. That's how you feel things. Now, if you want to jot down a couple of verses there just off to the side somewhere, just to have a reference to, in case you're wondering about this three-part thing, jot down 1 Thessalonians 5.23. That's where Paul, in the closing out the Thessalonian letter, said, I pray your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of Jesus Christ. And also write down Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12 is where the apostle or the writer of the Hebrew letter said the word of God is alive, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide between soul and spirit and joints and marrow, the body. So the Bible very clearly depicts us as a three-part being of body, soul, and spirit. Now, where's your brain? Your brain's in your body, right? You didn't have to come to church to figure that one out. Five minutes after you die and you go on to be with the Lord and you're with the Father in heaven, your brain's going to be back here in your body. But you're going to have a mind in heaven. So I want you to notice on the graphic here, your mind and your brain are not the same. The information gets intermixed, but it, they're not the same. And this is how you can be renewed in the spirit of your mind. It's actually in your body where all that etching takes place. Bad experiences, things that people said about you, people that, that called you names, and, and, and just things you expose yourself to, those get etched into the brain but you can still be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now, the brain is like a, is like a physical computer. Most of us are at least familiar with, to some degree with computers. And the brain is to our body what the memory is to a computer. Now, the way we load information into a computer is through the keyboard. We type, type, type. All this information I'm sharing, it's all loaded on a computer. And I typed it all in there. But there's also another way that information gets into your computer, and how's that? Through the internet, through software that you put in the, you put in the, the drive. And, and what happens when that information is bad? What do we call bad junk that gets into your computer? Called a virus, don't we? And most of our computers, we have anti, anti, antivirus software to try to keep that. And once that bad stuff gets in there, it takes time and a lot of labor to get it out. Sometimes we have to go to a professional. We have to unplug the computer and take it to a computer shop so that he can purge the virus out of our system. Well, what the, what the memory of a computer is to your computer, your laptop or your desktop, your brain is to your body. And stuff gets loaded into your brain. Some of it you put in there. You watched Ozzy Osbourne at 3 o'clock in the morning every night for 10 years. That's going to mess up anybody's mind. <laughs> Some of it just kind of came into your it came, you didn't ask for it. It just happened. You were, it, just, it just did. But that stuff gets in there, and so we need to deal with it. That information, like in a computer, it's through the keyboard, through the software, through the internet, or whatever. The information that comes into our brain comes through our five senses. Through sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing. That's how that information gets loaded into our brain. And it gets in there. And it lodges in there, and it gets etched in there. And if that uh, information is bad, it's going to affect us. Now, we talked last time, getting back to the soul part of us now, and our mind part, think about the difference between brain and, and soul and all that. If we think about our soul having this mind, will, and emotions, remember the snake illustration we closed with last Sunday, or last, uh, Sunday night? Yeah. Uh, we talked about, I walk into the room, there's this snake, and I don't like snakes, and so my mind sees the snake, and, 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 and my, uh, my mind says, you don't like snakes, snakes are dangerous, they bite, they can cause death, 
And so with my will, I jump back. I don't have to tell my will to jump back. It just does. And, and my emotions are at, at, a, at a peak. But then I realize it's a rubber snake. And then my emotions start coming down. And my mind then has new information that says, I'm not afraid of rubber snakes. They can't hurt. They don't bite. They're not dangerous. And so new information then in our hearts and in our life changes the way we look at things. But as we said before, truth must be taught and it must be accepted. It's not enough just to come to a class, take some good notes, take it home, put it on the shelf and say, man, I'm glad I went to Brother Tom's class. If I ever need that information, there it is. That's not enough. You've got to apply it. You've got to accept it as truth and apply it to your life. And if that information that's in your brain is bad, like 2 plus 2 equals 5. If you weren't here last week, that made no sense. <laughs> or that sin is black. Or the names that you were called as a kid. All that bad information that's in your brain has to be reprogrammed. And we have to take truth and replace that bad information with truth. Now, let's move on to another screen here. Prior to the... One more guy. There you go. Stop right there. Prior to salvation... You don't have to color yours in if you don't want to. Prior to salvation, you were dead spiritually. That's why that, that section is, is, is colored on the graph on the screen here. To depict the fact that you were born spiritually dead. Now, the reason why a lot of this junk got into your brain and got etched into who you used to be is because you had no spiritual decipher or ability to filter out or to decipher truth from error. It just came in. But then you were saved. Let's move on to the next screen. Now you're saved, and now you're spiritually alive in Christ, and now you're able to apply the biblical solution to your problem, which is truth. And if you're brought up believing inaccurate things, you can take truth and apply it. Here's one thing I want to ask you as we travel through this together. As we mention some things that uh, I, I'm, they're going to go contrary to what you were brought up believing, all I'm going to ask you to do is, is check and see is what I'm telling you, does it have any basis in truth in the Bible? Because let me share something with you just so you know that I know. I'm going to share some things with you during our time together in three Ps, and you're going to be mad at me. Or, the, or you're going to be mad at the Holy Spirit. Because I'm going to say some things that's going to go directly against what you were brought up believing was true. And yet I'm going to be able to go to the Word of God without twisting it, without without parsing, mixing, without kind of shuffling things. I'm going to be able to share with you what the truth is. And you're going to be on the horns of a dilemma. Are you going to continue believing the lie that you've been believing? Or will you believe the truth? Because I want to tell you, a lie doesn't give up very easily. It wants to hold on. You remember I talked about my pastor friend last Sunday night, how he had to go before his church and tell his church, I want to tell you, I have been teaching you a certain area of, of theology for years, and I've been in error. But this morning, I want to correct that error. As difficult as it probably was for my pastor friend to say that, it's going to be difficult for you to give up something that you used to believe. Um, some of you are still trying to find black sin in the Bible. You're just hoping that I'm wrong there. It's got, it's got to be in there somewhere. Now, all of us have these situations. I have this every now and then. People call me up and say, Brother Tom, I know this is in the Bible. I just, I know it's in there. If you, could you help me find it? 
And I'll look and look and look, and I got all these electronic Bibles. I can search all these different, and, and I say, I'm sorry, sir, it's just not there. Oh, I know it's in there. I, I heard this when I was in Sunday school. I mean, maybe Bob Barker said it on Price is Right. I don't know. <laughs> but it's just not in there. And that's how sometimes, and some, some of this information is not that uh, life-changing or critical, but we're just convinced it's in the Scripture. It sounds like it ought to be in the Bible, but it's just not there. And the reality is if we grab onto those things and we hold onto those things tightly, we won't let them go. Then we're going to keep believing and living a lie rather than living a truth. And it's the truth that sets us free. Certainly not information and certainly not incorrect information. So I'm going to challenge you. And if you get mad at me, uh, I forgive you already <laughs> because I love you. And I hope that you know me well enough by now. I'm not going to present something to you just to be different. I'm presenting things to you because they're truth. And I'm standing before you tonight to say to you, if you believe I ever teach you anything inaccurate, you have my permission to call me out. Because I want to be a giver of truth. The name Thomas actually means seeker of truth. I don't know why it means that. But I know that's what I want. And I want to communicate truth and I want to live in truth. Does that, does that mean I always live in truth? No, I'm, I'm, I'm a flesh and blood guy just like some of you guys. I'm a human being just like all of us. But I'm a seeker of truth and I want to live in the reality of that truth. Well, we've got to move on. We're just not going to get done tonight. Um, let me, uh, I, I do have some other things I want to share with you in, goodness, in the 10 minutes that we have left. Um, <laughs> Let's, uh, let's have some uh, prayer here for a minute. And, and then I want us to move to the second section. I do want us to get to this lust of the flesh section. I want to get this beyond us and behind us. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to you right now, I do want to thank you for this evening. I thank you, Father, for even now what we're getting ready to dive into. And I pray, Father, you would just give me the words to say to be able to share these things in such a way that they'll be meaningful, they'll be helpful. And Father, I pray even now for things I've said already tonight that's caused hurt. Not because I meant to hurt, but because it took us back to a childhood, or to a youth moment, to an adult situation where we were abused, we were accosted, we were yelled at, we were screamed at, we were called a name, we were treated the way we shouldn't have been treated. But I thank you, Father, that truth can set us free. And, and I pray, God, that you will give that to us tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're moving on now to this section on lust of the flesh. So if you flip to that side, as we talk about these three different root systems, the first one tonight, the lust of the flesh, which, which manifests itself in moral impurity. Notice the definition, an abnormal desire for pleasure. The lust of the flesh, which manifests itself in moral impurity, is defined as an abnormal desire for, ple for pleasure. Nothing wrong with pleasure, nothing wrong with going to Six Flags over Texas or, or, or whatever, going swimming or going to the beach or whatever, nothing wrong with that. But when that pleasure is abnormal, that's when the lust of the flesh is manifesting itself. Let's look at some biblical terms. The first one we're going to look at is lewdness. We've read that a couple of times already. If I give you a second word, it's, that's, uh, the first word I give you is from the New King James Version. That's the version I read out of and study out of mostly. The second word I'm going to give you, if I give you a second one, is coming out of the King James Version. So if you have the King James with you, open it right up and follow right along. I'm going to give you some verses, and we're not going to take the time to run to these verses. But I'm just going to give you some references to jot down. You can read them on your own. And if I give you a third word, it's just kind of another generic word that's used to kind of help illustrate. First one then is lewdness. The King James lists this as lasciviousness. Lasciviousness. Another word is licentiousness. So jot down Galatians 5.19. Galatians 5.19 says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. Lewdness is 
defined as the tendency to excite lustful desires. Lewdness is the tendency to excite lustful desires. Let me be uh, real honest with you here. A girl, a lady, can dress in a lewd or lascivious way. She might call it art. She might call it fashion. She might call it the style of the day. She might say, this is the way they make clothes these days, and I can't help it. But if she dresses in such a way that she incites lustful desires, that's what the Bible calls lewdness. Number two is sensuality. Sensuality is the word that is found in both the New King James and the King James. It refers, actually, it's a word that means to be natural. Jot down James 3, 13 to 15. In verse 15 it says, This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. Also jot down Jude 19, just one chapter in Jude, so Jude 19. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. Now, a definition of sensuality here is the preoccupation with the physical world. Preoccupation with the physical. Sensuality is not sexuality, it's a different word. It's preoccupation with the physical world. Jude says people who are sensual cause divisions. Now let's look at how, some, how, word, how this word of sensuality, what it means. It could be that you have a preoccupation with eating. Most of us have a little bit of problem with that. But if you find yourself going to the kitchen, when you go to the kitchen and you grab a chicken leg out of the refrigerator just because you need food in your hand, not because you're hungry, because you have, you have a desire to have food in your hand, that's an indication of sensuality, a, a, an abnormal attraction to the physical. If you have to buy a car every now and then just because you need to smell the newness and touch the newness of a car, not because you need a car, but, but you just like that newness, that's sensuality. I'm not saying you're a bad person. It just That's an indication of sensuality. If, um, if you have to, when you enter your house, if you have to turn the TV on just to have noise in the room because you want to be in touch with the physical, you're afraid you might miss something, that's an indication of sensuality. Now, sensuality invol involves, again, all those five senses of smell, touch, seeing, all that. Now, remember, this is who you were. Um... If you are a sensual person, you are a person who is attracted to the physical. And what we're seeking to do here is to figure out, is this who you were? Now, I'm not saying that if you eat or if you buy a car or if you turn on the television, you're a bad person. I'm just saying here, these are some indications to indicate to you whether you are a person who is given to the lust of the flesh. Third one is evil desire evil desire. The King James calls this concupiscence. Concupiscence. But write down Romans 7, 8. It says, but sin taking opportunity by the commandment produced in me all manner of evil desire. Jot down Colossians 3, 5. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil, desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Evil desire is defined as an abnormal desire or appetite that is stronger than that created in you by God. An abnormal desire or appetite that is stronger than that created in you by God. You say, well, if God didn't put it in me, how did it get there? Through that root system through feeding the tree that had your name on it. When a man who is married desires to have another woman, that is concupiscence. That's evil desire, according to the Bible. Number four is sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is also defined in the Bible as fornication. 
Jot down 1 Corinthians 6.18. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Sexual immorality is defined as inappropriate interpersonal activity between unmarried people. Code there. Number five, adultery. Mark 10, 19, jot down Mark 10, 19. You know the commandment, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. Adultery is inappropriate in a personal activity by married people with someone other than their married partner. It's amazing how many people are blurring the lines these days. They say, well, I can do this and this and this, but if, as long as I don't do that, I'm not committing adultery. I think interpersonal, inappropriate interpersonal activity kind of clarifies all that. Jesus actually said in Matthew 5, 27 and 28, You have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You don't have to just do that to commit adultery. Number six is defrauding. Defrauding is found in 1 Thessalonians 4, 6. No one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this manner because the Lord is the avenger of all such. Also, we also forewarned you and testified. Defrauding means to cause a desire or appetite in another person that cannot be righteously fulfilled. To cause a desire or appetite in another person that cannot be righteously fulfilled. Now, in the financial world, we talk about somebody defrauding another person, stealing from them. In the world of fashion, this is the twin sister to lewdness. A person can dress in such a way to create a desire in another person that cannot be righteously fulfilled. When a person dresses that way, let's use it in the female side, if, the, if a woman dresses that way to cause a person that's not her husband to create a desire in a, in a man that's not her husband, a desire that is abnormal, she's defrauding him. Now you might say, well, that's his problem. That's the point. There are guys out here, ladies, that have a problem. I've already said 70% of guys have a problem with moral impurity. And I know I'm, I'm, I'm treading where angels fear to tread. But when you dress in such a way that you create a desire in a person that's not your husband, you're defrauding according to the Word of God. I forgive you if you're mad at me. Uh, jot down 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 to 8. You might want to write that, read that whole section right there. Now, how do you know if this is your root problem? Now again, I'm not saying this is who you are. Who you are now, you're a saint. You're righteous. I'm saying this is who you used to be. But if we don't get this fixed, we can still be involved in this moral impurity. And I want to tell you what I'm talking about tonight is part and parcel to the problem in our world today. Sexual immorality is running rampant in our world. And we're asking, we're wondering, how is it ever going to stop? It stops when people get right with God. That's, that's when it stops. How do you know if this is your root problem? Let me give you, I think, four items here. First of all, indulgence in the pattern. Doing these things that we just talked about. If you have a tendency toward this direction, if you have a tendency to lust toward other men, or excuse me, other women, guys, if you have a tendency to, or ladies, if you have a desire to lust for other men, and it's an abnormal thing, it, because it's not what God put... This, this is an indication of telling you who you are. Or at least what you're practicing right now. Indulgence in the pattern. Secondly is a resistance to authority. I really wish I had time to read this, but I want you to jot down 2 Peter 2, 1 to 22. I please ask you to go home tonight and read 2 Peter 2, 1 to 22. A resistance to authority. People who have a problem 
with the lust of the flesh. When they are walking in the flesh, they are resistant to authority. For instance, you're going to the fair. A 17-year-old young man with a flashlight is serving as the parking attendant. And he's telling you where to park. And yet you say, I don't want to park there. I want to park over there. And I'm not going to park there. I am going to park over here. I don't care what this 17-year-old boy tells me. You are resistant to authority. And chances are you have a problem with moral impurity. Not, I'm not saying you run around your wife. I'm not saying you're an evil person. I'm saying that's a kind of a, a soft and simple indication that your flesh pattern is the lust of the flesh. If you read 2 Peter 2, 1 to 22 and Jude verse 8, it talks all about resistance to authority. Letter C here is an argumentative spirit. Hold the place, or you just, you just stay right there. I'm, I'm going to read something to you here in Titus 3, 8 to 11. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want, to, want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive man, an argumentative man is the idea there, after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped, sinning, being self-condemned. A person who has a problem with the lust of the flesh, when he's walking in the flesh, has an argumentative spirit. Have you ever known people that just want to argue? My, my mom used to have a lot of different sayings. She had one saying, would say, he would argue with a signboard if there wasn't a letter on it. That's a person who has an argumentative spirit. They just love to argue. They argue over everything. Now, you may love this person. You may be married to this person. But this is an indication of their flesh pattern. Letter D, excessive religious activity. Jot down Romans 1, 21 to 23. When people have the lusts of the flesh... The way they deal with this is, I'm going to talk about it here in just a minute, but what they, with the way they try to deal with it is through re excessive religious activity. They're trying to pay God off. They're trying to work hard. They'll serve on 14 committees, uh, teach three Sunday school classes, do whatever they can do to try to pay God back, but that's not how you deal with this. You deal with it with truth. Point number three here, how do you deal with with moral impurity. Some incorrect ways and some correct ways. Notice, first of all, incorrect ways. Sorry over consequences. Sorry over the consequences. Sometimes people who have the problem with lust of the flesh, they're simply sorry. Sorry they got caught. Sorry that uh, they're, they're, they were promiscuous and it cost them their marriage. Sorry that their kids won't talk to them anymore because of the way they live their lives. They're simply sorry. Number two, overcompensate. Overcompensate with religious activity. Or they redefine their convictions. What they say is, what, what used to be bad is no longer bad. <laughs> well, what I really used to think was really bad, it's, it's not quite as bad as it used to be, so you redefine your convictions. Letter B here, some correct ways. How do you deal with when you have a problem in this area, some correct ways, make a decision to get right. Make a decision to get right with the Father. If you want to jot down some good reading here, and I'd, I'd love to preach this message to you someday, it's all in, in the context of the parable of the prodigal son. It's a great image there of how a guy was, was out of the will of God and he made a decision to get right with his Father. So you make a decision to get right. You acknowledge 
who it is that you sinned against and then you make it right even at your own expense and there's one one I, I want to ask you to add there to your notes that I think it's on the screen not on your not on your notes walk in the spirit every day walk in the spirit every day now what is what is God seeking to do in a person who has a problem with moral impurity you see the reason why it's important that we know if this is our weakness is because if we don't understand what our weakness is then we're going to misunderstand what God is doing in our life because what God is going to do in the life of an individual no matter what their flesh pattern is God is going to build the very opposite into that person's life so what is God seeking to do one of the things he's, he's do, seeking to do in all of us is to transform us into the image of Jesus Christ, Romans chapter 8. But let me, let me give you uh, three things here that, that God is seeking to do in a person who has a problem with the lust of the flesh, which manifests itself in moral impurity. One thing he's trying to teach and build into this person is transparency. Transparency. People who have this problem need to live transparent lives. Let me share with you how you, can, how you can fulfill this. What that means is, is putting the computer in a public place. It doesn't need to be. If your husband or if you have a problem with moral impurity, the lust of flesh, your computer does not need to be tucked away in a lockable room. It doesn't need to be in a man cave somewhere. It needs to be out in the open, full to public view, because you need transparency. I'm not saying it's, it's you, you want it, but you need it. You need transparency. You also need an accountability partner. Let me also say one word about transparency, moms and dads. If you suspect your child has a flesh pattern of moral impurity, they don't need a computer in their locked, lockable bedroom. They may scream at you. They, may, they don't need privacy. They need transparency. And they will one day come back to you and they will bless you for protecting them. Rather than letting all that stuff up in their tree trunk. This person also needs an accountability partner. This person also needs to freely surrender their cell phone every now and then. It is amazing. It is appalling what people are doing on cell phones these days. If you have a tendency, if you sense what I've talked about tonight, and I know I had to race through this, but if you have a, a sense that this is your weakness, you need to be transparent enough to every now and then voluntarily surrender your cell phone and your text messages to your spouse. You don't need transparency. Excuse me, you don't need privacy, you need transparency. <laughs> that, was a, that was a slip there, wasn't it? It would also be a good idea for husbands and wives to share the same email address, same Facebook account. We have some folks here at the church that do that, and I'm so proud of them. I'm not saying everybody needs to do this. I'm, not, I, I'm in no position to tell you how to run your life. But, but couples that share the same email address, share the same Facebook account, what are they? They're living transparent lives. There's nothing going on in that communication world that they are afraid that their spouse won't read about. Now some would say, well, you just need to quit that stuff. Quit texting and quit Facebooking and, and get rid of it. And that's okay if that's what God leads you to do. But if your answer to your problem is don't do something, now we're back to the do's and don'ts. I know a lady who gave up Facebook because her pastor told her it was evil and it was going to destroy her life. And so and it, because of her love for her pastor, 
she gave it up. She quit Facebook. The same woman is about as far away from the Lord today as she's ever been. If your only answer to fixing your problem is to stop doing things, how many things are you going to stop? It's living a life of transparency. Secondly, what the Lord's building in your life is moral, morality and purity. Morality and purity. Jesus told Paul, where you are weak, Paul, I'm strong. He's building just the opposite. If the person is having a problem with immorality, he's building morality and purity into that person. And let her see true life within the framework of God. In order to live a life in the reality of God, as painful as it is, you have to admit who you were and live who you are. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you right now, I thank you so much for this evening. We have covered so much. Some will have to go over again in a private setting. And pray, Father, that you would just cause us to see how critical this area is to us as individuals, to couples, to families, to our culture. Pray, Father, as we leave here tonight, you give us safety as we go. And I look forward to our time next Sunday night. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you all. Good night.